Story 1 Dusk was descending on the city, a gradual dimming of light that seemed to drain the color from the world. The sky, a canvas of oranges and pinks, slowly succumbed to the encroaching shades of twilight. In this intermediary time, the city seemed to hold its breath, caught between the bustle of day and the quiet of night. The harbor, usually a hub of activity, was unusually serene. The sounds of the city seemed muffled here, as if the water itself absorbed the noise, leaving only the haunting call of distant seagulls and the occasional creak of moored boats. The cold wind blew mercilessly, a herald of winter, carrying with it piercing drops of rain that seemed almost like icy fingers brushing against the skin. In the corner of the harbor stood a huge cargo ship. Its massive structure was an imposing presence, its rusty sides a mosaic of brown and orange hues, telling stories of countless voyages, of storms braved and ports visited. This leviathan of the sea, now anchored in stillness, seemed like a slumbering giant, a relic of times long past. Beneath the dim light of a street lamp stood a man named Jake. His figure, slightly hunched against the cold, was rendered in stark relief by the pale light. His eyes, under the brim of a weathered hat, were fixed on the ship. Jake's gaze was thoughtful, yet there was a hint of unease in it, as if he saw not just the ship, but the shadow of something more sinister. His partner Ron approached him, his footsteps echoing on the damp pavement, breaking the somber silence that had enveloped Jake. Ron's breath came out in visible puffs in the cold air as he spoke. How long have I kept you waiting? He asked. Jake's response was a faint nod, his voice barely more than a whisper in the wind. Not long, he said, his words carrying the weight of thought. He then asked the reason for Ron's tardiness, his tone casual, but his eyes never leaving the ship. Ron, rubbing his hands together for warmth, explained about being stuck in traffic. His voice was a contrast to the hushed sounds of the harbor, lively and unconcerned. He added with a hint of intrigue, this is the same ship that was rumored. Jake's response was a murmur, almost lost in the wind. Yeah, there's a lot of strange stories surrounding that ship. My gut tells me something's not right, he said, his voice carrying an undercurrent of darkness, a hint of foreboding. Ron only grinned in response, a flash of white in the dim light. You're starting with your gut again, he chitted lightly. It's just an old, forgotten ship. But his tone changed as he added, but this is where all the threads of our investigations lead. Let's go see what it's hiding. We didn't drive all the way across town for nothing. They passed through the harbor gate, their footsteps a steady rhythm against the backdrop of the harbor's quiet. The gate itself was an old structure, its paint peeling, a silent sentinel to the comings and goings of the harbor. As they moved, Jake's mind raced with the information he had gathered about the ship. He had made some inquiries, spoken to a few old sailors and dock workers. The stories he heard were disturbing, tales of unexplained disappearances and strange noises coming from the ship at night. It all made for dark thoughts, but they weren't here because of rumors. They were investigating. In the shadowed embrace of the harbor, Jake and Ron, a pair of seasoned trackers akin to bloodhounds in their profession, stood surveying the old ship. Their expertise, a blend of intuition and meticulous investigation had been honed over years of tracing the steps of those who disappeared into the folds of the city. They were private detectives, yes, but their specialty lay in unraveling the threads of missing persons cases, often working alongside the police to untangle mysteries that left others confounded. Jake, the more taciturn of the duo, carried with him the history of a man once entrusted with the badge of law enforcement. His tenure as a police officer, however, was marred by controversies, accusations of excessive force, and a propensity for drawing his weapon a tad too quickly. These shadows from his past ultimately led to his departure from the force, paving the way for his current partnership with Ron. Ron, on the other hand, was the gregarious counterpart to Jake's stoicism. His approach was less about brooding silence and more about action, sometimes bordering on the audacious. It was this blend of their contrasting styles that made them an effective team. Their current case, a puzzle involving the disappearance of three students had led them to this desolate part of the city. The trail, a series of fragmented clues and whispers, had coalesced around this harbor, a place where the city's relentless energy seemed to ebb into a somber quiet. It was Ron who had unearthed a significant lead. 
sneaking into the room of one of the missing students, a move that was as risky as it was necessary. He had discovered a notebook. Its pages, filled with the scrawlings of a creative mind, contained a script for a horror movie. This was not just any script. It was a narrative woven around the very ship that now stood as a silent behemoth before them. Accompanying this script were photographs, old and worn, depicting the ship in an eerie light. The realization dawned on them. These students had embarked on a venture to bring their cinematic vision to life, using the derelict ship as their backdrop. As Jake and Ron delved deeper into the night, the harbor around them seemed to resonate with a palpable sense of history. The ship, a towering structure of rusted metal and forgotten stories, seemed to beckon them, holding within its bowels the secrets of the missing students. The night air, cold and biting, carried the salty tang of the sea and the faintest echoes of the city behind them. The harbor, with its dimly lit pathways and the occasional creak of moored boats, felt like a world apart from the bustling streets they had left behind. As they approached the gangway of the ship, the sense of foreboding that had gripped Jake since he first laid eyes on the vessel intensified. The ship, now a looming presence in the darkness, seemed to hold a morbid fascination. The faint creaking of its structure, the way its silhouette cut through the night ski, all added to the eerie atmosphere. Ron, ever the pragmatist, broke the silence. If those kids were here to shoot a horror film, they couldn't have picked a better location, he murmured, his voice barely above a whisper. Yet, even in his light-hearted remark, there was an underlying tension, a recognition of the gravity of their task. Jake, with a history entangled in both the realms of law enforcement and private investigation, had been drawn into this case by an old acquaintance from the police force. The case, which revolved around the mysterious disappearance of three students, had led them to this forsaken vessel. Jake's former colleague had mentioned the police's interest in the ship, but their hands were tied. The vessel's new owner refused to let police in without a warrant, and with the ship slated for dismantling, time was a luxury they couldn't afford. This sense of urgency was what led Jake to take on the case. Yet, as he stood at the threshold of the ship, a feeling of unease crept over him. The case was riddled with oddities, with questions that didn't quite add up. It was these unanswered queries that gnawed at him, like a puzzle where the pieces were there, but the picture they formed was obscured in shadows. The duo stepped onto the ship, their footsteps echoing in the vast emptiness. The vessel, once a behemoth of the seas, now lay abandoned, a ghost of its former self. The air inside was heavy with the scent of rust and salt, a remnant of its days traversing the oceans. The corridors were shrouded in darkness, the only light coming from their flashlights, casting eerie shadows on the walls. Doors along the corridor told stories of neglect and decay. Some hung off their hinges, others protested with a loud creak at the slightest touch. Windows, devoid of panes, allowed the cold night air to seep in, creating an atmosphere that was as chilling as it was desolate. The ship's interior was a labyrinth of corridors and rooms, each step further into its bowels amplifying the sense of desolation. The faint sound of water dripping somewhere in the distance was a steady reminder of the ship's slow succumb to nature. The walls, lined with peeling paint and streaks of rust, bore the marks of time and neglect. Jake and Ron moved cautiously, their senses heightened in the enveloping darkness. The silence of the ship was a stark contrast to the constant din of the city, making every sound, every creak and groan of the old structure more pronounced. The darkness seemed to press in on them, tangible and heavy. As Jake and Ron ventured deeper into the labyrinthine corridors of the ship, their flashlights cutting swaths through the oppressive darkness, Jake began to unravel the vessel's enigmatic history. His voice, a steady cadence amidst the creaking silence, wove the tale of the ship's past. The ship once belonged to a major cargo company, a titan in the world of international shipments. Its purpose had been mundane, routine even, to ferry goods from far-flung exotic lands to the bustling ports of the western world. But this ship's fate had veered sharply from the mundane into the realm of the mysterious. Jake recounted how years ago the ship set sail, its hull laden with goods from an unnamed exotic country. It had departed under the most ordinary of circumstances, yet shortly after leaving port, it vanished. The disappearance was not just a lapse in communication, it was as if the ship had been swallowed by the sea itself. Months passed, with the ship relegated to memory and speculation, 
a mere footnote in the annals of lost vessels. Then, as unexpectedly as it had disappeared, it reappeared. The ship was found drifting aimlessly close to the harbor, a ghostly apparition on the horizon. The most chilling part of the story, as Jake related, was the fate of the crew. The entire crew had vanished, their absence a gaping void in the ship's narrative. They seemed to have evaporated into thin air, leaving behind no clue, no hint of what might have befallen them. The mystery of their disappearance remained unsolved, a haunting question mark in the ship's history. As they walked, the dim light from their flashlights illuminated the walls, revealing more of the ship's eerie interior. Jake paused, his light resting on markings that marred the rusted walls, messages that told of unspeakable horrors. These messages, written in what appeared to be blood, spoke of a monster hidden within the ship, a malevolent entity lurking in its shadows. Jake explained that after the ship's mysterious reappearance, it had been subjected to exhaustive investigations. Teams of experts combed every inch of the vessel, their searches meticulous and thorough. Yet, despite their efforts, they found nothing. No trace of the crew, no hint of any monster, nothing to explain the blood-chilling messages that adorned its walls. As they delved further into the ship, the atmosphere grew increasingly oppressive. The air was thick with the scent of decay, a tangible reminder of the ship's long abandonment. The silence was broken only by the echo of their footsteps and the distant groan of the sea. Jake's voice, steady and somber, narrated the next chapter of the ship's cursed existence. After its mysterious reappearance and the inexplicable disappearance of its crew, the ship was, against all odds, put back into service. The decision, marred by controversy and whispers of bad omens, was driven by the pragmatic needs of commerce. The vessel was restored and set sail once more, its hull filled with goods from distant lands. But the respite from its haunted past was short-lived. A mere month after it returned to service, tragedy struck again with an eerie echo of the past. The ship, like a phantom, vanished from all radars, its presence wiped clean from the eyes of the world. And when it reappeared, a month later, the scenario was hauntingly familiar. The crew had vanished, leaving the ship drifting like a lifeless husk. The blood-curdling aspect of this second disappearance was the repetition of the bloody inscriptions on the walls. The messages, scrawled in desperation or madness, proclaimed that the monster was alive and that the ship was cursed. These words, a chilling echo of the past, sealed the ship's fate. It was never operated again, its story too tainted with the specter of the unknown and the unexplainable. Jake and Ron moved through the ship, their footsteps echoing in the vast emptiness. As they ventured deeper, Jake spoke of the aftermath that befell the cargo company that owned the ship. The curse of the vessel seemed to spread like a malevolent shadow, touching everything associated with it. The company, once thriving in the world of maritime commerce, started experiencing a series of inexplicable misfortunes. Ships didn't vanish like the cursed vessel, but other tragedies befell them. Mechanical failures, severe storms, and lost goods became frequent, each incident a blow to the company's reputation and finances. The company's downward spiral was rapid, its misfortunes too peculiar and frequent to be mere coincidence. The strangest and most tragic twist in the tale, as Jake recounted, was the fate of the cargo company's owner. A man once renowned for his business acumen and rationality, he descended into madness, his mind consumed by the curse of the ship. It was rumored that in a fit of desperation, he ventured onto the cursed ship armed with a shotgun, intent on destroying the mythical monster he believed was the source of his woes. He, like the others before him, disappeared within the bowels of the ship, never to be seen again. In the wake of these tragedies, the cargo company crumbled, its legacy reduced to bankruptcy and whispered tales of curses and madness. The ship, the epicenter of these misfortunes, stood abandoned in the harbor, a rusting monument to its own dark history. The decrepit vessel, a silent giant shrouded in darkness, seemed to hold its breath as Jake and Ron delved deeper into its bowels. The air was thick with the smell of rust and salt, a tangible reminder of the sea's incessant battle against the ship. Ron, ever the pragmatist, voiced his skepticism. In his experience, old ships like this one, along with abandoned houses and forgotten castles, were fertile grounds for rumors and legends. To him, 
The tales surrounding the ship were likely embellishments, the product of overactive imaginations and a penchant for the macabre. As they continued their exploration, the ship's walls revealed more of its chilling secrets. Bloody inscriptions, words like cursed family and run were scrawled across the corroded metal. The messages were unnerving, their presence a stark contrast to Ron's skepticism. Jake, examining the writings more closely, felt a chill run down his spine. The inscriptions were fresh, the blood still glistening in the dim light of their flashlights. The realization that they might not be alone on the ship was a jarring one. It was in this heightened state of alertness that they heard it. A noise, distant but distinct, not far from where they stood. The decision to investigate the noise was a unanimous one, born out of both necessity and a detective's inherent curiosity. As they moved towards the source of the sound, Jake inquired in a hushed tone if Ron had brought a gun. Ron's negative reply only served to heighten the tension. Jake, with a grim expression, revealed that he had brought a weapon, his instincts having warned him of potential trouble. Their progression down the ship's corridors was a cautious one, their senses attuned to every creak and groan of the old vessel. The realization that they were being followed crept up on them slowly, a growing sense of unease that turned into certainty as they heard the subtle but unmistakable sounds of footsteps mirroring their own. The corridors, with their peeling paint and rusted fixtures, seemed to stretch on endlessly, a maze of metal and shadows. The faint sounds of their pursuit were a constant companion, a reminder that they were not alone in this forsaken place. As they approached the source of the noise, the atmosphere grew increasingly tense. The flashlights, their beams cutting through the darkness, revealed more of the ship's decaying interior. A world frozen in time, a monument to its own dark legacy. As Jake and Ron approached the source of the sound, the noise and eerie combination of shuffling and faint footsteps suddenly stopped, plunging the ship into a silence that seemed almost suffocating. The silence was broken only by hurried movements, as if someone, perhaps several people were running away, their footsteps echoing ghostly in the vast corridors of the ship. Despite their efforts to illuminate the darkened passages with their flashlights, Jake and Ron could discern no sign of whoever was sharing this desolate space with them. It was as if the shadows themselves were conspiring to hide the ship's secrets. As they advanced, a discovery sent a chill down their spines. Scattered in a cluttered heap were items unmistakably belonging to the missing students. Sneakers, tattered clothes, backpacks, and, most telling of all, a camera. The camera a silent witness to the events that had unfolded on this cursed vessel, held the potential to unravel the mystery. With a sense of trepidation, Jake and Ron played the footage. The screen flickered to life, revealing the students in their final, carefree moments. They were jovial, their laughter echoing off the ship's walls, their demeanor nonchalant, almost boisterous. One of them, in a display of bravado, mockingly addressed the mythical monster of the ship, his voice loud and teasing. The footage showed the students moving towards the back of the ship, their laughter gradually giving way to a palpable sense of unease as they too began to hear unexplained noises. Initially startled, they pressed on, their camera capturing their journey deeper into the ship's heart. The atmosphere of the footage shifted dramatically as a scream pierced the air. One of the students had vanished. Panic set in, the camera capturing their frantic movements as they tried to find a way out their escape thwarted by the labyrinthine layout of the ship. In the dim light of the camera, one of the students suddenly began to scream, pointing into the darkness with a terror that was visceral. The footage became chaotic, the camera jerking wildly as something emerged from the shadows. The last images were the stuff of nightmares, a glimpse of sharp fangs, the sound of desperate screams, and then, darkness. Jake and Ron stood motionless, the camera's screen now blank, its last images etched in their minds. The ship, a silent behemoth around them, felt more menacing than ever, its secrets darker and more profound. The silence that enveloped them was no longer just an absence of sound. It was a presence, oppressive and foreboding. Jake and Ron came to a grim realization. The situation, with its growing horrors and the palpable sense of a malevolent presence, was beyond their capacity to handle alone. Deciding to retreat and call for reinforcements, they turned to leave the ship. But the ship, 
like a maze designed to trap unwary souls, did not relinquish its hold easily. As they attempted to navigate their way back, the noises around them intensified. The thuds and scrapes, once distant and ambiguous, now sounded like the deliberate movements of a predator closing in on its prey. The monster, a sinister shadow within the ship's dark corridors, seemed to be stalking them. Panic, a visceral and primal force, began to take hold as they found themselves unable to find a way out. The ship's interior, a labyrinth of corridors and rooms, seemed to shift and change around them, a maze with no discernible exit. In this heightened state of terror, they suddenly stumbled upon a huge, dark figure looming in the hallway. Instinctively, Jake fired his gun at the shadowy form, and they ran, their footsteps echoing in the claustrophobic confines of the ship. Their flight from the monster led them, by chance or fate, into a strange room. The room, a stark contrast to the rest of the ship, was furnished with several mattresses, scattered children's toys, and traces of dog hair, remnants of life in a place that seemed to have forgotten what living meant. It was in this surreal setting that they encountered an unexpected inhabitant of the ship, a gaunt, gray-haired old man with hands that trembled like leaves in a storm. The old man's eyes, clouded by years of darkness, barely registered their presence. His voice, when he tried to speak, was nothing more than a hoarse, unintelligible whisper, the product of years of isolation and silence. In the room, amidst the detritus of a life lived in the shadows, Jake noticed a photograph. It depicted a young man, his features stark in the clarity of youth, standing next to a tall, tanned woman whose origins seemed to be of native descent. The image, a frozen moment in time, seemed out of place in the desolate room. Realizing the impossibility of deciphering the old man's identity in their current predicament, Jake and Ron made a decision. Despite the unknowns and the lurking danger, they could not leave the old man in this forsaken place. He needed to be rescued, brought back into the light and warmth of the world outside the ship's oppressive walls. The ship, a floating tomb of metal and shadows, seemed to resonate with the silent steps of the monster prowling its corridors. Jake, Ron, and the old man made their way through the labyrinthine passageways, the oppressive darkness around them occasionally pierced by the beam of their flashlights. As they walked, Jake broke the heavy silence with a revelation that cast a new light on the grim narrative of the ship. He spoke of a report he had read, an account from an accountant of the bankrupt cargo company. This piece of information, previously a mere footnote in the larger mystery, now took center stage in Jake's theory. The accountant's statement revealed that during the ship's first disappearance, the son of the cargo company's owner had been on board. The owner's deep concern for his missing son was well known, but what happened after the ship reappeared was shrouded in secrecy. The owner was among the first to inspect the vessel upon its return. His subsequent actions, forbidding further surveys of the ship and declaring it free of any anomalies, were actions shrouded in desperation and denial. Jake recounted the accountant's recollection of the company owner's downward spiral. As the company faced repeated tragedies, the owner, in a drunken stupor, had locked himself in his office, ranting about his son being the cause of all his misfortunes. The climax of his madness was a fateful decision. Armed with a shotgun, he had stormed off to the ship, determined to confront his son. The conclusion Jake drew from these pieces of information was chilling in its implications. The old man they had found, frail and nearly blind, was likely the owner of the cargo company, a man broken by grief and madness. And the monster that stalked the ship's corridors? It wasn't hard to guess that it was his son, transformed into something unrecognizable by whatever dark forces the ship harbored. The atmosphere in the ship seemed to thicken with this revelation, the shadows around them appearing more menacing, as if they were aware of the story being told. The old man, a silent figure shrouded in mystery, seemed even more pitiable, a tragic character in a tale of loss and madness. As they continued their journey through the ship, the sounds of the monster's movements became more pronounced, a constant reminder of the imminent danger they faced. Ron, despite his inherent skepticism, found himself unable to refute Jake's grim hypothesis. The events of the night, each more surreal and terrifying than the last, had eroded his belief in the purely rational. As they navigated the labyrinthine passageways, their journey took an even more harrowing turn. 
the bloodhounds, Jake and Ron, came face to face with the monstrous entity they had been dreading. Its presence was overwhelming, a shadowy figure of nightmare and legend made flesh. In a frantic bid for survival, they made the heart-wrenching decision to leave the old man behind, focusing solely on their desperate escape. Their flight towards the exit, a race against an unimaginable horror, was abruptly halted. Another monstrous figure emerged, blocking their path to freedom. The realization that they were dealing with not one, but two of these creatures, hit them with the force of a physical blow. They were trapped, their fate sealed in the bowels of this cursed vessel. In a futile attempt to defend themselves, Jake fired his gun at the looming beasts. The bullets, however, were rendered useless against the thick hide and fur of the monsters. The werewolves, as they now realized these creatures to be, were impervious to their desperate efforts. The final moments of the bloodhounds were marked by screams of pain and terror. Overpowered by the werewolves' ferocity and strength, they fell victim to the creature's deadly claws, their lives ending in a maelstrom of violence and fear. The ship, a silent observer to this gruesome scene, seemed to absorb their final cries into its very walls. After the werewolves had dispatched Jake and Ron, one of the creatures returned to the old man. Instead of exhibiting the same ferocity, this werewolf displayed an unexpected gentleness. It carefully picked up the old man, cradling him with a tenderness that was starkly at odds with the violence it had just unleashed. Carrying him back to the room from which they had taken him, the werewolf spoke in a human tongue, its voice a strange mixture of beast and man. Father, watch over the children while we divide the spoils, it said. The old man, far from being afraid, smiled and nodded in agreement his expression one of understanding and acceptance. As the werewolf left the room, several children emerged from the shadows. Some bore the appearance of young werewolves, while others looked like normal children. They gathered around the old man, who embraced them with open arms. His face lit up with a smile, and he made a joyful, quacking sound, a stark contrast to the darkness that surrounded them. Story 2 In a perplexing maritime mystery that has left investigators and the public alike stunned, the lone vessel known as the Eagle Hauler was discovered in April 1998, adrift off the remote desert coastline of the Gulf of Mexico. This imposing vessel, which had become an eerie symbol of maritime enigma, was famously dubbed a ghost ship, due to the absence of any human presence on board. The Eagle Hauler, which was found to be carrying a myriad of containers filled with a diverse array of goods, including consumer products, electronics, and auto parts, left a trail of bafflement in its wake. This seemingly derelict vessel held within its metallic confines an enigma that had eluded investigators for months. The eerie tale of the Eagle Hauler began when it embarked from the bustling port of Hamburg, Germany, just a few months prior to its discovery in the Gulf of Mexico. The ship, its crew of 17 souls and its valuable cargo had seemingly vanished into thin air, a mere week after setting sail from the European port. A massive search effort was launched, but despite extensive efforts, the ship remained elusive, with the whereabouts of the entire crew shrouded in a cloud of mystery. However, a breakthrough in unraveling the enigmatic tale came to light when a diary, meticulously maintained by Dr. John Smith, the ship's esteemed medical officer, was discovered. Dr. Smith was renowned among shipping companies for his professionalism, sharp intellect, and compassionate nature. He was a doctor who left an indelible mark on every ship he served on, earning him unwavering respect and frequent invitations to be part of various maritime ventures. It is from Dr. Smith's own words, as recorded in his diary, that we can begin to piece together the horrifying events that transpired on the Eagle Hauler following its departure from the port of Hamburg. What follows is a riveting account, transcribed from Dr. Smith's diary, of the harrowing journey of the ill-fated ship. On September 3rd, 1997, I embarked on a journey that would forever haunt my dreams. The Eagle Hauler, a massive cargo ship, sat silently in the port of Hamburg, waiting to take us into the uncharted reaches of the ocean. The sky above was a dark, foreboding blue, reminiscent of a vast, velvet blanket covering our uncertain path. As I stood on the deck, I couldn't help but feel an overwhelming sense of tranquility. The crew, 
a collection of diverse and enigmatic individuals, had gathered to usher in the start of our long and treacherous voyage. I knew some of them by name, faces etched in memory, but not all. Among them was our captain, a man of great repute, Carl McCaw. He was a veteran of the sea, a man who had weathered countless storms and stared into the abyss, his equanimity and wisdom evident in every line etched on his face. My introduction to Captain McCaw was a memorable one, taking place at one of the raucous sailor's parties that seemed like a distant memory now. He had a magnetic presence that drew people to him, and after that unforgettable evening, he had extended an invitation to me to join his crew. At the time, I thought it was a good deal. The rest of the crew, a motley assortment of characters, remained shrouded in mystery. I knew I would have the duration of this voyage to unravel the enigmas that surrounded them. September 4th, 1997, dawned with an air of expectancy aboard the Eagle Howler. The light of a new day revealed a crew as diverse as the tempestuous sea itself. As we prepared to embark on this journey, the faces of my fellow sailors took on new meaning, each with a different story to tell. Captain Carl McCaw, the steely-eyed master of our vessel, commanded respect and reverence. He was the beacon of our ship, responsible for navigation, issuing commands, and liaising with the port authorities. His wisdom and experience were evident in every word he spoke. A true mariner, in every sense. The chain of command extended to first mate Captain Anna Smith, a woman whose reputation for reliability and exceptional navigational skills preceded her. Second mate John Reynolds, with his weathered features and a deep well of experience, was always ready to lend a hand at the helm. His dedication to the crew and his unwavering determination made him an invaluable member of our seafaring family. Among the sailors, Luke Jones and Carl Hope were the heart and soul of our crew. Luke's sense of humor was a beacon of light in the often dark world of a long-haul sailor. His laughter was infectious, and his stories of the sea kept our spirits high. Carl, on the other hand, was a bundle of boundless energy, an ever-friendly presence that brightened our days. Below deck, we had the machinists, Michael Brown and Sarah Wilson. Michael, the chief machinist, possessed a silent determination that bordered on grimness. His technical prowess was unquestionable and in the face of mechanical challenges, he was unwavering. Sarah, his assistant, had an air of quiet confidence about her, a reserve that hinted at a depth of knowledge waiting to be tapped. The stewards and galley attendants, Lisa Martin and David Wallace, ensured that the crew was well fed and cared for. Electrical engineers Alexandra Harper and Daniel Zhao were the guardians of our ship's power. Their technical expertise was crucial, ensuring that our lights and systems continued to function smoothly. Navigators Richard Jones and Allison Carter were the cartographers of our destiny, guiding us through uncharted waters with precision and care. Meteorologist James Smith kept an eye on the ever-changing moods of the skies, offering vital information to Captain McCow. The meteorologist's predictions often meant the difference between safety and peril on our journey. And finally, shipping agent Linda Wilson, the organizer of all port services, logistics, and financial matters. Her role was very important in making sure our voyages went smoothly. In the depths of the ship, we were joined by fellow longshoremen Mark Stevens and Drake. These two rugged individuals were the backbone of our crew, toiling tirelessly to ensure the cargo was loaded and unloaded efficiently. I had my assistant nurse, Natalie, with me. We had been working together for quite some time. She is a professional. As a doctor, my role was to know every member of the crew intimately, to be their confidant, their healer. September 5th, 1997, presented itself as a day brimming with both possibilities and curiosities. The crew of the Eagle Howler remained in good health, leaving me with ample time to delve deeper into the mysteries of our ship. My passion for the sea had only intensified over the years, a burning desire that had led me to the deck of this impressive vessel. As a child, I had dreamt of becoming a ship's captain, but the ironclad will of my father had steered me down a different path, and I found myself studying to become a doctor. Yet, the allure of the open ocean had never left me, and the call of the sea still echoed in my soul. This voyage offered me a chance, albeit in a different capacity, to satisfy my longing for maritime life. My thirst for knowledge led me to explore the eagle hauler in great detail, 
It was a ship that embodied modernity and technology, a behemoth equipped with the latest state-of-the-art systems. I reveled in the opportunity to dissect its inner workings. Our navigation equipment was second to none, featuring GPS systems and electronic charts that ensured precise positioning and routing. Radars and anti-collision systems stood vigilant, constantly scanning the horizon for potential threats and ensuring the safety of our voyage. Automated course control and vessel stabilization systems made for a smooth and efficient journey, even in the roughest of waters. The engine room revealed powerful and efficient engines, their operation overseen by advanced control systems designed to optimize fuel consumption. Computers monitored every aspect of the ship's mechanical systems, their constant vigilance a testament to our commitment to safety and efficiency. The electrical power equipment was equally impressive, boasting power generators with emergency switching and redundancy capabilities to guarantee an uninterrupted power supply. The ship's state-of-the-art communication and navigation systems included radio systems for contact with other vessels and shore stations, as well as satellite communication systems for voice and data transmission in remote maritime regions. Safety remained paramount, with modern firefighting and emergency alert systems in place to protect both the crew and our precious cargo. Tracking and access control measures were implemented to deter unauthorized entry and ensure our ship's security. But what truly left an indelible impression on me was the lifting equipment. Modern cranes, forklifts, and various other devices designed for the efficient loading and unloading of cargo. As I explored further, I even came across automation systems that controlled the ship, including autopilot and energy management systems. It was with a hint of jest that I remarked to Captain McCaw that with such advanced equipment, one might wonder if the role of captain and crew would become obsolete replaced by artificial intelligence and automation. The captain's response was a grim chuckle, and he cautioned me not to underestimate the power of the sea. The ocean, he said, had a way of revealing its true nature when least expected, no matter how advanced the technology at our disposal. I took his words to heart, sensing an unspoken truth lurking beneath the surface. Entry dated September 7, 1997. As the first week of our voyage unfolded, the Eagle Hauler cut through the waters without incident, the vast expanse of the ocean stretching out in all directions. A sense of routine settled over the crew as everyone diligently carried out their duties. The ship's advanced technology hummed in the background, a testament to human innovation and the indomitable spirit of exploration. All seemed well, and there was no sign of impending trouble. However, it was on a dark and eerily calm night that the first tendrils of unease began to weave their way into the tapestry of our journey. Murmurs among the crew members gave voice to unsettling tales of strange noises emanating from the depths of the ship. But it was not just the spectral specters of the night that would disturb our peace. A fortuitous celebration, the meteorologist James Smith's birthday party, brought an unforeseen consequence. James, reveling in the festivities, indulged in more libations than his body could handle. He awoke the next day with a throbbing headache and a gnawing sense of regret. His hangover had clouded his judgment, leading us to overlook the approach of a major storm, a tempest that should have set off alarms. The storm raged with a ferocity that tested the mettle of our ship and crew. The eagle hauler was tossed and turned in the tumultuous sea, its massive bulk at the mercy of the elements. We emerged from the maelstrom battered but intact, though the ship bore the scars of the ordeal. The state-of-the-art equipment that had once been our pride now lay in disarray, a broken link to the world beyond. Communication with the shore was severed, a consequence of the Tempest's wrath. The captain, ever stoic, was not one to entertain excuses. He demanded that the problem be resolved with utmost urgency. However, for reasons that remained shrouded in mystery, the ship's cutting-edge technology eluded our grasp. It was either too advanced for our engineers to fathom, or the necessary spare parts for repair were nowhere to be found. The isolation we experienced was growing, the tendrils of the unknown weaving their way into our lives. It was among the loading crew, the men who toiled in the shadow of the cargo, that the most disturbing whispers surfaced. They claimed to have seen a massive lurking shadow moving among the crates and containers, their accounts were met with skepticism by the captain, who believed that fatigue and fear could play tricks on the mind. However, for the sake of safety, he ordered a vigilant watch over the ship's cameras, and a strict mandate against wandering the ship alone. 
Entry dated September 10, 1997. A somber cloud descended upon the Eagle Howler in the wake of the relentless storm. Days blurred into one another as we navigated the unpredictable waters of the Atlantic Ocean. Each sunrise and sunset a reminder of our isolation. The situation on the ship grew grimmer by the hour, as a pervasive sense of unease took hold. It was a few days after the storm when a disquieting revelation struck the heart of our already troubled crew. The news swept through the ship. Agent Linda Wilson was missing. She hadn't been seen in days, and her absence was marked by untouched items in her quarters. Linda was last seen leaving the mess hall, her figure slowly disappearing into the darkness. Concern etched lines on Captain Carl McCaw's face as I approached him, seeking answers to the disquieting mystery. We've looked everywhere for her, John. He confessed, his voice heavy with worry. No sign of her. It's as if Linda just disappeared into thin air. It's unlikely she fell overboard. I'd even say it's impossible. I couldn't help but question the ship's surveillance system, which boasted an array of cameras. Surely they would have recorded something, shedding light on Linda's disappearance. But Captain McCaw's response was disheartening. The storm wreaked havoc on the surveillance system. Half the cameras are out of commission, and the rest only show static. To make matters worse, our communications are still down. This is unprecedented in all my years at sea, John. Desperation and dread gnawed at the edges of our collective psyche as we grappled with the inexplicable disappearance of one of our own. Within a day of Linda's vanishing, an unsettling discovery was made. Her ID and watch were found abandoned behind a maze of pipes near the engine room. The circumstances surrounding how her belongings ended up there were a haunting enigma. No one had seen anything, and the lack of functional cameras in that part of the ship meant that the shadows held their secrets close. And yet it will remain a strange, terrifying dream. Soon, according to our itinerary, we must complete this journey and reach the port of New York. September 14th, and our voyage across the vast expanse of the ocean continued without an end in sight. The journey had become an interminable stretch of time, and the arrival in port, which should have occurred days ago, remained elusive. A heavy shroud of uncertainty enveloped the ship, a palpable tension that infected the crew. The silence of the captain, Carl McCaw, hung like a cloud over the vessel, leaving an eerie void where reassurance should have been. The crew, once a cohesive unit, was now a collection of nervous glances and hushed conversations. The anxiety in the air was as thick as the sea spray that lashed our decks. The unanswered question of our prolonged journey loomed large, gnawing at the fringes of my mind. When I sought explanations from the crew, they were as lost as I was. Frustration and fear painted their faces, and they all pointed to the captain and his closest aides for answers. I decided to confront the source of our collective disquiet and make my way to the captain's quarters. But fate intervened leading me to eavesdrop on a conversation between our first mate, Anna Smith, and the second mate, John Reynolds. Their voices were hushed, their words laden with apprehension. They discussed a navigational error that had led our ship astray. John Reynolds questioned the autopilot's involvement in such a grave miscalculation. He suspected that someone, with nefarious intentions, had tampered with the system, deliberately altering our course. It was a revelation that sent a chill down my spine. The gravity of the situation struck me, and I understood that they were laboring to restore the autopilot system, attempting to guide us back to our original route. Another disturbing revelation emerged from their conversation. The disappearance of steward David Wallace. His belongings, they said, had been discovered behind the water supply bay, a bloody testament to an unknown horror. The unease that gripped my heart had deepened into a sense of foreboding, that seemed inescapable. Though I had stumbled upon this conversation by chance, I could not remain silent. My duty as a doctor and a member of this crew compelled me to confront the captain and seek answers. When I approached him, Carl McCaw waved me off dismissively, his words laden with an air of reassurance that did little to dispel the pervasive darkness. September 16th, and the descent into darkness on the Eagle Howler took a malevolent turn. The veil of dread that had wrapped itself around the ship thickened with each passing day. My assistant nurse Natalie was the latest victim of this sinister force that seemed to lurk among us. First assistant captain Anna Smith, bearing witness to a nightmarish ordeal, 
reported hearing blood-curdling screams echoing through the hallways. She rushed to the source of the screams, but upon arrival found nothing but an empty, eerie silence. Electricians Alexandra Harper and Daniel Zhao, disturbed by the same cries, joined the frantic search. The trio discovered drops of blood forming a gruesome trail, leading them to a nightmarish scene. Natalie's femur had been torn from her body by unimaginable force, leaving a horrific tableau of terror. The rest of her was nowhere to be found. I wept for my lost companion. For Natalie and I had shared years of service, and her absence left a void in my heart. The realization struck us with a force that threatened to drown us all in a sea of horror. The perpetrator of these atrocities was among us, a silent specter hidden in plain sight. The panic that had gripped the ship was a contagion that spread from soul to soul. As a doctor, I knew the perils of prolonged isolation and severed communication with the outside world. Such conditions could gnaw at the edges of sanity, inviting the abyss of mental instability. I ventured my theory to Captain Carl McCaw, who admitted to sharing my concerns. He proposed a preventative measure, a collective conversation with the crew. In the midst of this nightmarish uncertainty, it was a glimmer of hope. A forum for the crew to share their fears and perhaps, just perhaps, unveil the face of Natalie's murderer among us. It was a surprising turn of events. The once stubborn captain had conceded his earlier attempts to withhold information, realizing that transparency was our only weapon against the darkness that had enveloped us. The eerie darkness that had enshrouded the Eagle Hauler extended into the early morning of September 17th. Captain Carl McCaw and I embarked on a grim endeavor, individually calling each crew member for discussions. While I lacked the qualifications of a medical psychologist, my basic knowledge allowed me to pose pertinent questions, recording their answers and scrutinizing their behavior for any telltale signs of disturbance. As the interviews progressed, a disconcerting uniformity emerged. The crew members went about their duties diligently, their composure intact. They had not exhibited any sense of loneliness or despair prior to the spate of disappearances that had cast its shadow over our journey. There was a collective belief that our ordeal would soon come to an end when we reached port. Hope was a fragile ember struggling to ignite against the encroaching darkness. However, a recurring theme emerged during these conversations, one that sent shivers down my spine. Many of the crew members insisted they adhered strang, disketing noises at night. The captain and I had not personally experienced these sounds, but the persistence and consistency of the claims were unsettling. The cargo crew, the captain's aides, and even the meteorologist attested to the eerie cacophony that pervaded the ship after dark. Two crew members drew our attention, sparking a niece within the crew. Drake, one of the cargo crew, maintained that a malevolent, Black entities stalk at the ship, feasting upon the crew in the dead of night. He claimed to have witnessed it and had attempted to share his revelation with others, but they dismissed his words as the ramblings of a terrified mind. Drake's fear was palpable, rendering him a near recluse who cowered within his quarters. We had to convince him, almost forcibly, to join our conversation. The second individual who aroused suspicion was the missionist, Michael Brown. Always reserved and distant from the rest of the crew, he exhibited nervous behavior during the conversation. His statements were disjointed and contradictory, casting a sinister shadow over him as Diminor. The captain and I shared our concerns regarding Mikhail's behavior, recognizing it as a potential lead to uncovering the truth behind the ship's descent into madness. Following the preventative conversations, Captain Macau and I made the unsettling decision to closely monitor Drake and Michael. Their peculiar behavior and the disquieting claims they had made demanded our attention. September 19th, and the situation aboard the Eagle Hauler had spiraled into chaos. It became increasingly evident that the specter of madness had infiltrated our ship, sowing discord and mistrust among the crew. We weren't the only ones who suspected Michael the Masonist. Others had noticed his erratic behavior, and Alexander Harper, an electrical engineer, had stumbled upon a disturbing secret. In a bold revelation, Harper disclosed that he had witnessed Michael hiding something within the confines of his cabin. The gravity of this revelation was undeniable, and it led to a fateful decision. Captain McCaw and I took it upon ourselves to investigate Michael's quarters and found some of the missing steward's belongings. Why had Michael hidden this undeniable evidence of his guilt? I could not find an answer to this question, 
apparently traveling by sea had negatively affected Michael's psyche, and he was no longer responsible for his actions, could not think straight. While the investigation continued within the confines of Michael's cabin, turmoil erupted on the ship. Luke Jones, one of the sailors, descended into a frenzy, intent on delivering a savage beating to the beleaguered machinist. It was a violent outbreak that threatened to escalate into a ship-wide lynching, had it not been for the timely intervention of First Mate Anna Smith. In the wake of this chaotic scene, we were left with no alternative but to take Michael into custody. The crew assigned themselves in shifts to guard him, understanding that the darkness that had consumed one of our own could just as easily take hold of others. As we sailed onward, the prevailing hope was that the worst of the ordeal had passed, and the journey to port would proceed without further accidents or disappearances. However, the oppressive atmosphere that had taken root within the ship continued to linger, like an unrelenting fog that obscured the path to salvation. September 24th Century the horrors on the Eagle Hauler seemed to possess an insatiable appetite for darkness, as they refused to release their grip on our ship. Luke Jones, the formidable sailor who had once sought vengeance against Michael, had now become the latest victim of the malevolent force that stalked us. Luke was a behemoth of a man, towering in stature and possessing the strength of a titan. In his youth, he had made a name for himself in the brutal world of professional bare-knuckle fighting. It was difficult to fathom who or what could overpower a man of his stature. Panic and desperation ensued as we combed the ship in search of the missing sailor. Our quest ended in a gruesome discovery that sent shivers down our spines. Luke's lifeless body had been reduced to a macabre tapestry of carnage. His once mighty form lay torn asunder, bearing wounds that appeared to have been inflicted by a savage, wild animal. As I examined the gruesome remnants of the man I had known, I couldn't help but entertain the horrifying notion that Drake's ramblings might hold a kernel of truth. Perhaps, in the shadowy recesses of the ship, an evil force, something beyond our comprehension was lurking. Michael, the machinist who had been under close surveillance for a full day, was now absolved of suspicion. The evidence of his guilt had unraveled, leaving him innocent but still under careful watch. The situation remained dire and the captain and I grappled with the realization that the malevolent presence among us remained elusive. Trapped in the boundless expanse of the unforgiving ocean, cut off from the outside world and devoid of functioning communication equipment, we were at the mercy of an unseen predator. The surveillance cameras remained dormant, the autopilot malfunctioned, and the ocean's vastness offered no escape. Our tormentor, whether a sinister entity or a cunning individual, reveled in the cat and mouse game, savoring the despair that had settled upon the eagle howler. September 26th entry marked the descent into a maelstrom of madness and terror aboard the eagle hauler. The malevolent force that had been haunting us showed no respite, and the frequency of disappearances escalated to an alarming degree. First, it was the navigators who vanished into the abyss of the ship's corridors. Then, the second mate of the captain followed, vanishing without a trace. In the wake of these eerie disappearances, one of the loaders met a similar fate. John, our trusted meteorologist, went missing next, leaving us without the guidance of his expertise. The grim pattern of disappearance continued, when one of the electricians, Alexander, undertook a perilous journey to repair the faltering communication equipment. He never had the chance to complete his task, and at the sight of his vanishing, we were greeted with a haunting message daubed in blood upon the walls. Games are over. With each passing day, the crew grew more reclusive, retreating to their cabins in a desperate bid to escape the clutches of the malevolent presence that lurked aboard the ship. The vessel itself had become a labyrinth of fear, devoid of functioning navigational systems and plagued by a malfunctioning autopilot. The captain, once our beacon of leadership, was now lost in a storm of technical malfunctions and panic. Nature itself seemed to have turned against us as we found ourselves ensnared by another raging storm. The tempest howled outside, a malevolent chorus that mirrored the terror that had gripped our hearts. I, too, was overwhelmed by fear, cowering within my cabin, dreading the moment when the unseen predator would come for me. The captain had intended to gather us all in a single room, seeking safety in numbers and the opportunity for collective vigilance. But his plan remained unrealized, for he, too, succumbed to the relentless tide of disappearances. His absence left us adrift, 
our once unshakable leader vanishing into the abyss. None of us dared to venture in search of him, weighed down by the looming specter of our own impending doom. It was first mate Anna Smith and I who summoned the courage to embark on the perilous quest to locate our captain. September 29th. Our quest to find the captain ended in horror. We discovered only a gruesome relic of his presence, a severed head with part of his face gnawed away. The wall beside his remains bore a macabre message written in blood. Your dessert. The chilling words sent shivers down our spines, and we understood that our tormentor reveled in terrorizing us. First mate Anna Smith was visibly horrified by the gruesome discovery, and she urged us to heed the captain's plan. Gather all remaining crew members in the common room of the mess hall. Through the radio room, we broadcast the call, hoping to unite all who remained. However, by evening, only five of us had braved the gathering. Anna, the previously suspected machinist Michael, second electrician Daniel Zhao, and sailor Carl Hope. The whereabouts of the other crew members remained a mystery, leaving us to speculate whether they were missing or cowering in their cabins, paralyzed by fear. Anna and I recognized the necessity of taking turns on duty, for trust had eroded to the point of near extinction. While I harbored some level of trust for Anna, doubts lingered, particularly in regard to Michael. We wrestled with the disconcerting possibility that the murderer could be among us, or that the enigmatic unholy entity Drake had warned about was real and lurking somewhere aboard the vessel. Drake himself had vanished adding another layer of uncertainty to our dire predicament. The Eagle Hauler, once a vessel of purpose, had transformed into a foreboding trap, setting sail on an unknown course. The five of us, huddled in the dimly lit mess hall, trembled with fear and paranoia. I clung to my diary as a thread of sanity in the unraveling tapestry of terror that enshrouded us. We had no inkling of how long we could endure this nightmare, but one thing was certain. We were determined not to become the next course in this sinister feast. October 1st. I was jarred awake by a blood-curdling scream, a sound that sent shivers through my already frayed nerves. In a surreal nightmarish scene, I witnessed something unimaginable. Zhao, the second electrician, under attack. A dark, massive, and furry assailant tore at his flesh, clawing viciously at his legs. Zhao's agonized screams pierced the air as this monstrous entity dragged him away, disappearing down the shadowy corridor. Panic gripped me as I scanned the room for Anna, Michael, or some semblance of an explanation. Yet Anna was nowhere to be found, and Michael's absence added to the mounting unease. Carl, who sat beside me, seemed in a trance, repeating the word, werewolf, in a trembling voice. My futile attempts to rouse him and inquire about Anna's whereabouts yielded no response. In a shocking turn of events, Carl abruptly stood, seized a knife, and with a rapid, deliberate motion slit his own throat. His blood sprayed across my face, an eerie baptism of terror. Stunned and horrified by Carl's inexplicable act, I was temporarily immobilized. It wasn't until Drake Materialis is seemingly out of nowhere that I was yanked from the grip of shock. He urged me to act, insisting that we had to flee. My initial bewilderment gave way to the sheer urgency of the situation, and I followed him without hesitation. The sole question echoing in my mind was, where is Anna? Drake, my newfound guide in this nightmarish scenario, led me to a hidden technical compartment within the ship. He swiftly opened an iron grate cover, revealing a narrow passage leading downward. My confusion and fear rendered me entirely reliant on Drake's guidance, and I followed him blindly through this labyrinth of pipes and iron beams. After a lengthy descent, we arrived at a concealed chamber that had served as Drake's refuge. Surrounded by bars and metal, this hidden enclave was indiscernible from the outside. However, the true horror lay within, as Drake revealed the mountain of human bones that had amassed over time. The sheer sight of it sent shivers down my spine, and I recoiled in terror. Drake's laughter rang out, an eerie sound that seemed tinged with madness. My instinct was to retreat, as I feared that I had been lured into a trap, and that Drake intended to add me to the grisly collection of remains. However, Drake dispelled my fears, insisting that he harbored no sinister intent. He explained that this chamber was a sanctuary, 
a haven of safety from the malevolent entities that had laid waste to the ship. Drake's frenzied narrative unveiled a horrifying tale. He claimed that we were situated above the creature's nest, safe because the overpowering stench of decay masked our human scent. He spoke with the fervor of one who had defeated these horrors and lived to tell the tale. Drake insisted that he had outwitted these monsters, demonstrating a duck determination to assert his newfound authority. When I inquired about his experiences, Drake cryptically alluded to having seen everything and declared himself the new captain, asserting that his word was law. The realization that my sanity teetered on the brink sent a cold shiver down my spine as the boundaries of reality and nightmarish fantasy blurred in the hellish bowels of the ship. Date unknown time has become an abstract concept. I am adrift in a sea of eternal night. Drake and I spent what felt like an eternity within the confines of our refuge. Days blurred into one another as our provisions dwindled and desperation crept in. It was then that Drake, his sanity waning, attempted to end my life in a futile bid to survive. A brutal struggle ensued, and by some miraculous twist of fate, I managed to thwart his murderous intent. In the throes of despair, Drake experienced a sudden, inexplicable revelation. Whether it was a brush with death or the consequences of dehydration, his mind, for a fleeting moment, regained clarity. His dark intentions evaporated, replaced by a grim determination to venture into the ship in search of sustenance for both of us. With newfound resolve, he departed, leaving me in the confines of our shelter. The hours, days, or perhaps even weeks that followed, passed in agonizing isolation. I clung to the bars that separated me from the rest of the forsaken vessel, yearning for Drake's return. When at last a distant noise disrupted the eerie silence, I strained my eyes and ears to discern its source. Slowly, the shapes of two nightmarish creatures materialized, gnawing ravenously on a macabre feast, Drake's lifeless body. Their monstrous hunger satiated, the creatures succumbed to exhaustion, and, with haunting transformation, shifted from beast to human. I watched, transfixed by horror and disbelief, as Michael and Anna emerged from the bestial transformation. These monstrous creatures that had haunted our hellish voyage were none other than my former shipmates. Michael stirred first, rousing Anna from her feral slumber. Their whispers sent shivers down my spine, for it was a cruel revelation of evil. Anna contended that I might have leaped into the unforgiving embrace of the open ocean, mimicking the fate of second mate John Reynolds. Michael, on the other hand, said that I was hiding somewhere, and by all means he wanted to find me and catch me, that he still really wanted his dessert. A chilling declaration left no room for doubt. Their sinister exchange of sibling-like camaraderie revealed the true extent of the horror that had consumed them. But the most chilling realization of all was that I no longer cared for my fate. In the shadow of death, I found solace in knowing that I had not become the cannibalistic monster's dessert. Last Diary Entry Dad, you were right. I should have just worked at the hospital as a regular doctor.